Hello everyone, welcome to this afternoon's session. I think everybody's just arriving in now. Um, yeah, we're all here, brilliant. Hello, um, I'm Lucy and today I'm gonna be leading our little session, um, a little bit of an interesting topic for you today. So I'm gonna try to say this and not butcher the pronunciation immediately. Uh, Fanthropology, the power of the fandom. So this is a little bit of an unusual topic here for Communicate, but it's quite an exciting one. Um, so we've got a lovely panel of folks today that are going to discuss the power of fandoms and fans and just generally fanning over stuff um, and how that can be a really useful tool in relation to the environmental movement, uh, the nature movement, biodiversity movement and all of that. So um, we'll jump straight in and do some introductions. Uh, first of all, I'm Lucy. I go by uh, Lucy Lapling on social media. Um, I'm probably a number one nature fan. I think if nature was a band, I'd, I'd be a groupie. Um, I'm a self-confessed nature nerd and um, a lot of the feelings that I, I see within fandoms to do with pop culture and bands and music and that kind of thing, I myself would profess to feel um, when it comes to the natural world. So um, that's why I'm here. I'm kind of being that link between um, these guys' amazing studies and um, our natural world. So um, Yes, today we're joined by uh, Rebecca and Tom and Richard. And if I'd like to hand over to Rebecca first, would you like to introduce yourself? Um, yeah, hi everyone. Um, really, uh, really glad to be invited um, along to talk to, uh, to talk to you all today. Um, I'm uh, Rebecca Williams and I work at the University of South Wales in Cardiff. Um, I'm a senior lecturer there in communication and media and cultural studies. Um, and uh, my kind of main research into um, fans has been um, usually around either sort of television viewers. So I think there's definitely some overlap between some of that and um, the way that people are engaging with um, kind of nature on television, nature programming, um, but also uh, very much looking at um, place and space and locations. So again, um, hopefully there'll be some interesting um, connections with thinking about uh, the sorts of places where engagement with with the natural world um, happens um, across the panel as well. Brilliant, that's great. Thanks for introducing yourself, Rebecca. Uh, next, should we go to Tom? Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Dr. Tom Phillips, uh, and I'm a lecturer in humanities at the University of East Anglia, which is in Norwich. Um, like Rebecca and like Richard, uh, we are Fan Studies Scholars and we are part of a collective called the Fan Studies Network. Um, and yeah, my my kind of research background, uh, like my like my colleagues and friends here, is about studying various different kinds of kinds of fandom. So I've looked at uh, perhaps some of your more stereotypically nerdy texts, uh, Star Wars and, and Alien, uh, for example, uh, if 16 year old me could have pictured this job, uh, 16 year old me would be very happy. Um, but I've also kind of looked at uh, uh, and written about, I think, elements that may be of interest to the audience today. Uh, for example, fans engagement with uh, celebrity. Um, uh, online practices of fandom uh, and also uh, uh, fan activism as well as something I've written about. And so, uh, yeah, I think there are going to be some crossovers uh, with, with what the audience may want to talk about today. Brilliant. And uh, straight over to you, Richard. Uh, yes, hello, and uh, thank you also to me, uh, not to me, uh, from me to you, uh, for inviting me to the um, to speak uh, at this great event. Um, so my name is Richard McCulloch. I am a senior lecturer in media and film at the University of Huddersfield. Um, and my research, uh, very similar to, to, to Rebecca and Tom, really, um, has been always very interested in um, the relationship between media organisations and media audiences or media fans. Um, I did start off looking mainly at the audiences, the people themselves, the fans, real people. How are they using different media um, texts and objects and celebrities and people? What are they doing with them? How are they responding to them? How are they interpreting the thing that's in front of them? How did they discover it in the first place? But over time, my research moved um, not away from that, but kind of adding something onto that, which is what I'm kind of interested in talking about today, which is, um, not just the fans and the audiences themselves, but the the ways in which media industries and organizations and brands have come to see uh, fans, that's really changed a lot in the, in the time that I've been doing my research. Um, so whereas, you know, 20 years ago or so, 
fans were kind of like, yeah, we knew they existed. They're kind of over there on a little corner of the internet or at weird little fan conventions or something like that. Nowadays, um, they've become a lot more mainstream, right? There's a, there's, a, there's a widely held assumption, and I'm not just talking about media fandom and media industries here, I'm talking about all kinds of industries, organizations, economic sectors that are looking to people we might call fans, they might go by other names like enthusiasts or geeks or nerds or whatever, um, they might just be, they might use completely different words. Um, I mean, you yourself, Lucy, you, you describe yourself as a nature nerd, but there might be people who are kind of, you know, if they're a bird watcher or something, they might just call themselves a bird watcher rather than a fan of birds. Um, but we're talking about the same kinds of things. We're interested in people who are um, emotionally invested in something and that connection takes place over a, a but, well, it's a long-term relationship, basically. Um, but one of the things I'm really interested in is the way that, yeah, as I said, organizations and industries have come to embrace that. So there's been a bit of a shift over the past, let's say, two decades-ish um, with regards to how different industries view fans. So, so as I said, no longer seeing them as, as weird nerds. They're kind of embracing them as, I mean, the, there are those those views and stereotypes still do still persist, um, but increasingly they're being treated like valuable consumers um, because they can you know they can potentially generate a lot of profit. They're often very loyal. Um, their enthusiasm often encourages other people to get enthusiastic about stuff. Um, we can talk more about this throughout the panel. I don't want to monopolize the opening conversations, but yeah, that's that's kind of what I'm really interested in talking about today. Brilliant. So you're kind of, yeah, the super team of, of fan knowledgeable people, aren't you? Um, that's a really interesting comparison that you mentioned there um, towards kind of nature nerdiness and, and bird watching in particular. And I'm sure a lot of people who are, are listening, perhaps who have a familiarity with um, the environmental NGO sector, so the charity sector in the UK, um, there is that very much what I can see that crossover of culture types um, and I think particularly a hobby as as you said traditionally geeky as bird watching and I am a proud bird watcher I'm not dissing it I absolutely love it um, but you can certainly see that there's elements of that kind of culture that would be akin to some of that kind of fan behavior you know the terminology and the the attire and what you wear and all your little uh, in jokes and your sayings and that kind of thing so I don't know if any of you've got anything to say on that front anything that could compare I think we're all too polite to uh, want to talk <laughs> over each other. Um, I, I guess I think it's it's interesting. Uh, I suppose Richard might want to kind of talk about this a little bit as well, but in terms of like the um, uh, the way in which fan practices like that have been adopted and been more uh, readily accepted uh, by people in many, many different cultures. So this idea that actually to, uh, as Richard kind of alluded to a second ago, the idea that to call yourself a fan or some of something or to call yourself an enthusiast or something isn't is is one i think today more than ever will more as a badge of honor than something to to be ashamed of like richard i don't want to step on your toes because i know you would want to talk about that is there anything with regards to that you'd like to talk about yeah well i think i think the thing that's interesting for me is that it's it's easy to kind of assume that when a cultural shift has taken place in with regards to how a group of people or a thing is perceived. Um, I think it, it might be tempting to just pat ourselves on the back and go, aren't we progressing as a culture? People are getting nicer, right? We don't, we don't, you know, laugh at um, you know, Star Trek fans like we used to. Like that now they're in the Big Bang Theory and they're the heroes of the show. And or or we can look at something like, I don't yeah, sci-fi and fantasy is a good example, really. You can see the shift that that genre has undergone over the past couple of decades. Look at something like Stranger Things which is a show which has absolutely been made to cater to people who would happily call themselves geeks. Uh, that geek, that geek uh, moniker isn't necessarily, like, like Tom said, it's a badge of honor now, whereas it, it might have been an insult um, several decades ago. Um, something like Game of Thrones, I don't think that show could have been, I'm not saying it couldn't have been made 20 years ago, but it certainly wouldn't have been a mainstream success. It wouldn't have been cool to like Game of Thrones and talk about a show which is about you know, magic and, and dragons and, and things like that. Um, but the, I guess the point I want to make around this is that it's not just um, that people have got nicer to, to fans and kind of, you know, accepted that, yeah, each to their own and all that kind of thing. Um, it's that 
the industries have cottoned on to the fact that they can make money off these people. So Netflix particularly know that a show like Stranger Things is great because it it hits all these kind of you know emotional buttons like it's basically like I, I love the show I'm not I'm not dissing Stranger Things but it's basically large parts of it are you know have you seen E.T. have you watched anything Steven Spielberg's ever directed um you know uh, do you remember the 1980s wasn't that fun you know that kind of thing um and 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 that's that's nice for the fans but it's I think it's important to one of the things we often do in fan studies is, is we don't just you know look at the fans and go aren't they interesting or aren't they fun or aren't they creative or whatever they are those things as well but it's also about examining the the power relationships that are involved in this um because that's where there is potential to do lots of good but also potential for for example fans to be exploited right that their, their, their emotional connection to something is being uh, milked for for the capitalist organizations basically um i often think football fandom is a good example of this particularly when you're a fan of a, a sports team you're basically a fan for life and no matter what the owners do no matter how many how many awful things they they do and how many things they expect you to cough up for fans basically do it and i'm not i'm not judging fans for doing that that's not you know they're not they've not been duped or whatever that's that's the nature of a fanish attachment to something is that you are emotionally invested in it and you will be very loyal through thick and through thin i like the term fanish attachment i feel like i have a fanish attachment to a uh, to birds <laughs> it's a good term um have you got anything to say on that rebecca um i think i think what's interesting as well along alongside that is that for for a long long time as, as kind of rich and tom have both sort of said the idea of being fanish was very much associated with um certain kinds of texts so science fiction fantasy um and people who liked cultural things that were seen to be highbrow so if you were really into shakespeare if you were really into the opera you wouldn't necessarily talk about yourself as a fan or in, in that way you would talk about yourself as an aficionado or as a follower of something um and fan studies has started to try and look into some of those um, kind of cultural objects in different ways and think about those as fandom. And just thinking about the links to kind of natural history, um, I think maybe some of the, the reasons why it isn't necessarily thought of as a kind of fandom is maybe that it doesn't quite fit into that kind of where is it high? Is it just for, you know, people who go to museums? Is that where natural history lives? Is it people who go to, I don't know, uh, you know, natural history sites is it people who can have certain amount of money to pay to go to those places and so I wonder whether sometimes we don't think about it as, as kind of fanish or, or as those attachments as being fanish um, because we're not quite sure what sort of kind of culture um, engaged with natural um, natural history actually is so that's that's something that I think maybe fan studies can help with a little bit. That's really interesting um, and yeah from my perspective um, I suppose I, I can see these uh, kind of um, correlations between fan culture. I, I will hold my hands up. I have been a fan. I've been that person in the past. Um, when I was a teenager, I worshipped the band The Killers, followed them around, stalked them. My signature is still based on The Killers' uh, lead singer's surname, for heaven's sake, Flowers. Um, it was very bad. But I felt that kind of zealous attachment to something and that kind of passion that, you know, I would spend all of my pocket money on that. I would do everything. And I can feel that same sense of draw and love and passion about the subject I study now, um, which is, is wildlife and the natural world. But one of the things I love about it, and I think you touched upon it, Richard, is that um, it is much more difficult for capitalism to exploit it it's a lot more of a, a thing that they can't quite grasp because although, um, you know, there are places that charge to get entry. So, you know, going into a nature reserve or you need the tools, the kit, you know, the binoculars, all of that um, to be able to, to watch nature. Fundamentally, it can't all be taken away from you because you can just look out the window and see birds or you can look in your garden and see creepy crawlies. And um, I'm not sure about other people here, but um, for me, there is that kind of like fanish element. And this year, you know, an example of something that I've seen just kind of kick off this kind of subculture is a little bit earlier in summer, I found, I was really lucky enough and so excited to find a jay feather, which is a little blue feather off, off a bird, which is quite an unusual find. It's really exciting. And it just kind of sent this, I was so excited about it. I posted about it and it's just kind of built this like 
I don't know, this building up of more and more people finding them, going out and searching for them. And everyone's, you know, are you in the Jay Feather Club? Are you not? Lots of people posting photos with it. And it's that kind of excitement. And like you said, that that kind of like inside, I don't know, uh, yeah, joke and, and kind of thing that you get. Um, but I suppose, you know, I'm thinking here for me, nature is the idol. But there are some kind of idols within the nature movement. Obviously, you know, I'm sure there's one that can come straight to mind that people think of. So I don't know if um, either of you or any of you want to have a, a little chat about um, the fact that there are some of these celebrities within the natural history world, whether it's people off TV or within activism, that kind of are those personalities that draw people to and what kind of relationship that has with fannish behaviour. <laughs> yeah, I think the idea of fan, uh, fans of celebrities is is something that I'm you know I'm sure we're all kind of uh, readily familiar with, um, and certainly within fan studies, studying that as you know, a celebrity as a fan object. And I think within this context, I think that's really interesting because uh, I think has already been said in a couple of comments. It's it's where does natural history live? I think Rebecca uh, put it as you know it's it's hard to it's hard to be kind of a fan of of something that just exists out of your window. Um, I wasn't necessarily going to do this, but I'm going to uh, I'm just going to pick up this picture off my wall because I have got that there. And I think actually this is kind of a really good tool to be able to kind of explore some of those ideas about what David Attenborough is and what does he mean to people. So I, I picked up this print from like a local fair here in Norwich. And, you know, the idea that he's got this Father Earth banner. I don't know if that's backwards for people on my camera. Um, but, you know, to for me to have that on my wall says something about kind of the reverence I would have for David Attenborough. And I think it's the same sort of thing at any time David Attenborough trends on Twitter. Uh, more often than not, you're going to see tweets saying, oh, my God, I thought he was dead. I'm glad he's not, you know, and that's really interesting because if you're if you're talking in real terms, well, actually, what would David Attenborough's death mean to me personally? It's not going to affect my day to day life very much, but people have these uh, these emotional attachments, these kind of parasocial attachments that we'd call um, to celebrities where they feel that they are part of their family. And this idea, I think, particularly somebody like David Attenborough, because uh, uh, somebody in the chat has said somebody like David Attenborough, Chris Packham, I think maybe Chris Packham to a lesser extent, but that these are generational figures within this field. Oftentimes when we're looking at uh, celebrities, we might be looking at new trends. Who's the new celebrity and what are they doing that's perhaps somewhat significant or different? How are their fans acting that might be different? There are some figures, particularly within this field, that have been around for decades. So Chris Packham is someone who I remember growing up uh, on The Real Wild Show. And probably for people of an earlier generation, uh, it was Terry Nutkins for them. Um, and someone like David Attenborough has been around for literally decades. And I think to be able to see what these people are doing with their celebrity, because I think in some ways we might think of David Attenborough as kind of this pure father earth figure. Everything he's doing is is absolutely uh, uh, beyond reproach. And I love David Attenborough and I don't want to have to say a word, bad word about him. But I think what we would do as academics is perhaps be like, maybe with a cynical eye say, well, what is he doing to try and encourage that culture around natural history? So I was looking, his his book that was released, it was either earlier this year or late last year, uh, A Life on Our Planet. And I looked at like press releases around that time and it was all about David Attenborough's call to arms. And he was trying to inspire and provoke this sense of activism. So he was quite knowingly using his his celebrity persona and his celebrity profile um, as a way to get people invested in natural history and uh, to uh, and in climate change and to protect the planet. Um, and I think for us as as scholars of fandom, we're interested in like, well, well, how do fans react to that? Uh, quite often, the most dedicated fans will will accept those messages and seek to uh, uh, and seek to join into that uh, into that activist movement of course with any kind of activist movement you're then going to see a contrast to that so Greta Thunberg is a great example of someone who's trying to inspire others who is then met with with opposition and um yeah so I think the important thing to think about is that we have these figures asking questions about well why do we particularly why are we particularly reverent of these figures uh, and what are they doing with their position? Because as Richard said earlier, 
even though David Attenborough is not a corporation, he's he's not he's not on the surface of it actively trying to make money off people. Um, he still has a great degree of power, um, and he still his voice uh, carries a lot of weight. And I think uh, it's it's responsible of 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 everyone. I think to kind of question who we put in those positions of power and why. That's a really, really good point. And especially in, in the face of th these bigger questions around the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis, you know, um, it's very easy to look at something like a fandom and think, well, how can we, I'll use the word exploit, exploit that for, for money and for gain. But, you know, at what expense? Is it at the expense of the planet? Is it, you know, consuming things that we don't need to? Um, so I think, yeah, I think it's really interesting to see that kind of pop icon factor happening around people who are environmental campaigners you know it's it's really interesting to see the same kind of feverishness um about it i've got a david after t-shirt and whenever i wear it people are like oh <laughs> where did you get that that kind of thing so it is that yeah that subculture um rebecca richard do you have anything else to say on that um yeah i was thinking whilst um tom was talking it and you, you've sort of made the point there about um there's there's been a, a shift in the last only the last couple of years I think within fan studies to looking more at ethical consumption um, and looking particularly at how um, fans in many ways are contributing towards things that we wouldn't necessarily consider to be very good for the environment or for, for the climate so if you think about um, one of the things I research which is kind of collecting merchandise sort of material fandom um, you know, everything from clothing through to kind of plastic action figures. None of these things are great for, for the earth. You know, these things are quite disposable. They are using up natural resources. Um, my own research looking again at places, people have to fly often to go to, to visit sites. Um, so there are, I think, some emerging um, kind of work that's coming out where fan studies is trying to look at how fandom itself can be more ethical um, and can try and, and and respond to some of these changes while still maintaining you know what people enjoy about in getting involved with things um and so that again i think might as that moves forward that might be somewhere where uh, there was a question in the chat about how can we learn from fans how can we how could people kind of harness climate fandom or, or to get people to actually act um and I think that this is, is one of the places where maybe that is starting to happen because there are some fans within some established fan cultures that are starting to say, well, actually, we do need to think about what we're using, what we're buying, how we're how we're behaving, because these are things that we are concerned about. And these have real world impacts as well. And I think that's that's a really interesting place that fan studies is, is starting to go. Fascinating. Yeah. Sorry, Richard, were you going to come in then? Yeah, no, just to, just to add quickly, I think um, Tom and Rebecca uh, both raised really interesting and, and useful points there. Um, I think just to return briefly to, well, actually to link something that Tom and Rebecca both said, Tom mentioned the need to be sort of critical. That's sort of part of our job is what, what, we, what we get paid to do. Um, and Rebecca talking about um, the ethics of consumption. Um, just returning to this question of celebrity in particular, um, I would say, while it's obviously really great and really important that celebrities like David Attenborough, um, you know, get involved in social and political cause. Lots of, you know, Hollywood actors do this sort of thing as well. They, you know, they speak up. They might use um, uh, the, the Oscars, like their acceptance speech to, to make a statement. I remember um, Leonardo DiCaprio a few years ago when he won for The Revenant, he made a statement about um, indigenous people and indigenous, indigenous lands and things like that. So. You know, people do speak up on, on certain issues, and that's obviously a really valuable thing. Um, because celebrities, whether you're someone who loves celebrity culture or hate hate celebrity culture, and there are many people in both camps, um, I think whether, whichever of those camps you're in, you can't deny that celebrities pretty reliably get generate attention, and attention is a really valuable commodity itself. Um, some people in media studies talk about us living in what's called an attention economy in the sense that like you know there are only so many hours in the day there are only so many social um, you know social media posts you can look through or so many tv shows you can watch or so many links you can click on so how so attention is at a premium so 
companies, corporations, brands are always looking for ways that how do they get to be the one that you click on or the one that you stop scrolling and you pause on for a few seconds to, to read. Um, so celebrities are obviously really useful for that purpose. They can cut through a lot of the noise of a media landscape that's really saturated with just stuff and messages and things all the time. So that's obviously a good thing. However, I would question whether attention for the sake of attention, is that really what we want? Um, and I think we need to try to think of, so, so people, so for example, people watching this who maybe enlist the help of celebrities, maybe big celebrities, maybe minor celebrities, um, whatever kind of scale they're on, um, that's, those are often the kinds of public figures that are brought in to help, you know, open a new museum or raise awareness for a new, a, a particular environmental cause, right? Um, but is that attention sustained? Because what happens often is in the media landscape that we live in today, um, stuff can seem like the most important thing in the world for a few hours or, or maybe a, a few days or weeks, right? But then the news cycle moves on and it, we move on to something else. And I think when we're thinking about something like the environment or natural history, particularly in the context of the climate emergency and global ecological crises, I think it's really, really important that we ensure that the attention that we do generate for any kind of particular cause or a, like a nonprofit or a, a particular organization or a, a natural reserve or something like that, that we try to think of ways to make sure that attention is sustained, not just a flash in the pan for, you know, five minutes of, you know, you get a few days in the news cycle, you get a load of clicks and a load of engagements on your social media, stuff that you can say to your manager, hey, look, the event was a success, wasn't it great? Um, I would say, you know, be critical of, you know, if you work in that kind of field, yes, it's great if you get those engagements, but what's the upshot of it? What does it actually lead to? Does it lead to tangible, like people actually getting involved in, you know, visiting, I don't know, a particular wetlands trust more often every year or, or um, committing to regular charitable donations or something like that. Because it's that it's only that sustained investment in something that's that we, we, we desperately need, I would say. That is a brilliant point. I really, really like that. Um, and that's exactly what it's about. So from my personal perspective, uh, my social media that I do, you know, I, I draw attention to causes. If there's a campaign or if there's an issue going on, you know, I will, you know, rally and cry. Let's all get together. Let's sign this petition. Let's call this out. Let's change this. But the underlying theme of everything I personally try and do, and I know a lot of others do as well, is to embed that long term, slow connection that's deep. It's it's weaving that love for the natural world into your life. So it's an everyday basis. It's something that you you do without thinking and, and I've I've personally come on that journey you know I was a 20 year old that was out every weekend high heels night out did not own binoculars <laughs> knew barely anything about the natural world um and now I'm somebody who actively chooses to go twitching over going to the pub um and the amount of kind of nature knowledge that I that I've built up has happened because I've become that fan of the natural world and I've I've flipped that kind of perception of things and I think what a lot of environmental issues that you know a way that we can fix them you you were touching before I think Rebecca and Richard both of you on um consumerism and that collecting habit of of fandoms um consumerism largely is very very unsustainable people using things that they don't need buying things that they don't need because we're sold it and we're told to, to purchase it um slowing down and reconnecting with nature is a complete rebellion against that system you're completely rejecting consumerism because you can be entertained by a tree. You don't need to buy anything. You don't need to purchase anything. You don't need to make anything. And exactly the same with collecting. I mean, I am a collector. I'm a hoarder, but I'm a hoarder of natural things. I've got a nice pebble collection. I've got so many feathers that I could, you know, stuff a bed with them. <laughs> but I, I collect and hoard things from my own kind of passion area, and I don't have to spend a penny to do it. So you can still that, exhibit that love behavior. Um, but you're also learning, you have a lot more knowledge and um, you're not kind of damaging. So I think it's it's all good and well, everybody becoming involved in activism and being cause led. But I think the overall problem with the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis personally is that we as Western civilization just need to slow the heck down <laughs> um, and stop using so much. So I think it's it's really interesting to, to look at how we might regenerate people's connection with the natural world in order to to save it, to just you know make us realize we don't 
need to quite live so so fast and um, furious with it all. So, um, yeah, we've had some really good questions in the chat. Um, I don't know if you guys are up for answering a few of them. Yeah, um, we've got one here from Charlie Porter saying, do any of you have any thoughts about what we can learn from the way fandoms behave and interact and how we could channel their passion and dedication into creating engaging climate projects or even climate fandoms? I don't know if one of you wants to go first. Re oh, Rebecca? I'll, I'll oh, go. Tom, yeah. sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Um, yeah, I think it comes back to that idea about um, emotion um, that, that has been kind of picked up on. Uh, I think all three of you have all kind of talked about emotion because if we, uh, when we're trying to define fandom, a, a definition uh, that I always like to use is the, uh, um, from Cornell Sandvoss, an academic, who talks about like sustained uh, emotional engagement with a particular object or text. Um, and how we get that that sustained emotional engagement when it's when it's a television show you can get that through the television show being broadcast so every week you know that this particular show is going to be on and you have that uh that sense of routine uh sustained emotional engagement i think is is harder to achieve when it comes uh to kind of climate projects or, or the natural world i was uh um interested in what you were saying lucy about kind of that that idea of when when you transformed from kind of you know wanting to go to the pub to wanting to go out on, on a walk for example uh i've i've felt that in the last year i've always really liked bees uh but only in the last year when i've had a, a house with a garden of my own have i been able to indulge that um and i've been able to have that kind of i suppose a sustained emotional engagement with the amount of bees that i have in my garden and so it's it's trying to find those elements or those instances where people can engage regularly and and have something that is personal to them uh, so it's i think it's difficult when you start when you talk in big terms about the climate emergency and about you know how much oil shell is is pumping into the oceans because i i can't personally do anything about that and individuals can't necessarily personally do anything about that it's about okay well what can you do at a local level what groups might you get involved with and i think it's it's bringing it down uh, it perhaps shouldn't be that way it's that it's a very kind of neoliberal way of thinking about it i think but um i think trying to get people trying to find a route or a hook for people to find their own emotional engagement for something uh, might be a, a useful way forward for that. I think that's really, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, Rebecca. No, no, no over to you. Um, I was thinking about that and without getting into, into too much of the kind of the, the theory of, of kind of fan studies approaches, I think what's interesting is that there's usually there's always been a balance between fans as individuals and fans as collectives or members of communities um and and i think what tom is saying there is absolutely right that you find your own emotional engagement but i think the other thing that maybe we can learn from from how fandoms operate is generating that sense of community because again if you feel connected to other people or whether that's in your physical local area whether that's through talking to other people on platforms like instagram TikTok, what whatever is the new you know the new the new place for people to go i think if you can generate a sense of community i think it it it's a sense of obligation almost to other people as, as well as as to yourself and, and to your own in, in kind of engagement with the environment um but it can also then obviously be a way for sharing information for sharing um ideas resources um as well as then allowing people to form emotional connections to each other as well as as to you know the bees in the garden or, or whatever they're particular. i love bees as well so i'm happy that bees um so i think i think that balance between the individual and how we can kind of use or, or look at um community models that fandoms use and see how maybe that can be something that can be built on as well i think might be um something to think about yeah and um i would i would say um one lesson that we can uh, take from from having studied fans, I think this this definitely connects back in what, what with what Rebecca was just saying about the the collective power of, of fan communities, um, which is actually something I, I, I see a lot in in your um, Lucy your your social media kind of posts and things is is the the value of of enthusiasm, right? That 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 fandom itself being enthusiastic about something 
is a value. I, I don't really like using the word currency in the context of something that I don't I want to take away from money and stuff. But it is a, for want of a better word, it's a valuable currency um, in the sense that, uh, yeah, enthusiasm often begets enthusiasm. Right. If and this is something I, I try to do in my own teaching, if I'm doing a topic that I know is going to be a little bit hard work for my students, I will try extra hard to be super enthusiastic about how cool and weird and exciting and fun it is and useful and hope that some of that enthusiasm translates. Um, but what's really key and something we see from a lot of the, the backlash, because that one thing that's important to remember, just because we're talking about fans, it's not always about liking stuff and being pleasurable and everything being lovely. Um, often fans are really angry, really frustrated, arguing with each other. Um, and it's all part and parcel of the same thing. In, in fan studies, we often talk about fandom as being a balance between fascination and frustration. So it's something you love, but often you're frustrated with it, maybe not being quite the way that you want it to be. So fans can sometimes be more critical about the thing they love than people who aren't into that thing at all. Um, but yeah, so I think if you if you want to generate enthusiasm around something, I would say above all else, it has to be authentic enthusiasm. You can't really well I say I say you can't fake it. There probably are ways you can get close to faking it, but you shouldn't do that. So if you're listening to this and you you, you work for an organisation that's trying to like, how can we you know surface level make it look like we're an authentic version of this thing? Don't do that. Um, it has to be embedded throughout your whole organisation, everything you do. Um, it can't just be, you know, a tokenistic gesture here and there. Let's put on a nice event for the fans or let's talk to them. Let's have a little social media event where they get to ask us questions and we'll talk to them back um, like we're on the same kind of level. Because um, otherwise it can come across as, you know, the Steve Bashimi meme where he's like, how do you do, fellow kids? And he's like a 50-year-old man wearing a backwards baseball cap and a, carrying a skateboard. It can seem a bit like that. So um, the example... Probably simultaneously, my favorite and least favorite example of this in the last couple of years was the the Pepsi advert with Kendall Jenner um, a couple of years ago. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> so it was, it was basically like um, taking the visual language of protests and particularly Black Lives Matter kind of protests and using it to sell Coke. So, she, so she, Kendall Jenner, she's at a fashion shoot. And she gets a, pe a sorry Pepsi. Um, she she gets a Pepsi and she gives it to a police officer, and all of a sudden it's all cool, and everyone's friends, and they're all having a great time. Um, that got an immense amount of backlash from people who are invested in things like Black Lives Matter, who are invested in Pepsi, even fans of Kendall Jenner weren't happy about it. You know, all of this kind of thing. So fans can be a real force for pushing back against things as well. If you don't don't do something in a way that feels authentic, then um, it can really do long-term reputational damage to, to the brand or the organization or the, the cause that you're trying to get attention for. So not all attention, not all publicity is, is good publicity. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. Yeah. So we're bringing together their enthusiasm and community and uh, yeah, just making sure that you're very careful with it as well. Um, I like that you touched on a meme there because um, I think one example I think quite often with these with these kind of fandom communities, they are self-built. You know, it's not, I know you're saying that a lot of the industry now is kind of coming from a point of view where they're, they're manufacturing something to be able to create its own fandom. But that fandom is often quite self-regulated and, and people will create their own subculture within there. Um, and there's a particularly good example. I don't know if anybody's a member of Wild Green Memes on Facebook, um, but it's a meme page, Wild Green Memes for Ecological Fiends. Um, and it's got a couple of hundred thousand members across the world of basically people who work in the ecology sector, whether it's conservation or uh, wildlife science or anything like that. Um, and it's just memes about the sector. And it's just within that there's factions that have developed. So people who represent the bird gang or the fish gang or the reptile gang and everybody's in like jokey war with each other. Um, but like you said, it's that kind of there is that that balance between like criticism and love for the thing as well. Um, so a lot of it is quite critical of the the conservation sector and the nature sector. Um, so it's quite an interesting thing. Um, we have a few more questions in here. I don't know if you we've got time to answer. Yes, we have. Um, Kiri Thompson says, do 
Uh, any of you have any thoughts about how we balance the fandom of the natural world without negative impacts? For instance, with the collection point you raised, Lucy, not everyone would do that responsibly and we could end up having more of a negative impact on nature. Same with people spending time in nature and leaving litter. So I suppose that's kind of taking the points of, um, you know, a really big fandom growing and people kind of getting excited and swept up in it um, and it becoming too big for itself and going into that territory of people perhaps. Uh, damaging things without realising what they were doing and that kind of thing. I don't know if anyone's got any thoughts. I, I can go. If, um, no mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I would say the key for this is to think about fandom beyond um, consumption. Um, so often those two terms are often conflated with each other. And, you know, rightly so, a lot of fandom does involve different kinds of consumption. Um, but it doesn't have to just be about that. And I think um, particularly with relation to, in relation to you know, the natural world, um, maybe the focus should be not so much on trying to get um, fans of the environment or you know, bird watchers or aficionados or whatever term we give to them, rather than trying to think, how can we get them to buy something or how can we get them to consume something? Um, it's how can we get them to do something? Um, and because, because actually this is, you know, speaks to one of the points I made earlier about the need for um, long term commitment to something, right, rather than just surface level flash in the pan kind of things. Um, it's about creating experiences, because if you create an experience that that fans are invested in, that becomes much more personal than just buying a thing. And I, I don't want to put her on the spot, but I know Rebecca, Rebecca's done a lot of work on this. She's done some really excellent work on on people who go into go to theme parks and places places like that and the ways that those kinds of uh, you know emotional attachments to a particular place having an experience around yes they're paying for the for the pleasure of going to somewhere like you know Disneyland or whatever but that might not be necessarily be the case with a say a nature reserve and having a really it might sound stupid but like having a really lovely time at a nature reserve is uh, is an important kind of experience that will hopefully, if it's done in a particular way, if it's um, managed in a particular way, can lead to repeat visits. It can, you know, harness someone's love of the environment or a particular national park or whatever and try to get them invested in, um, sorry, my dog's making really weird noises. It's just distracting me. Um, it, can, it can try and get them to, um, yeah, be invested in this stuff kind of long term rather than just short term. Rebecca, did you want to come in on that? Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was just going to sort of follow up, I think, on, on, on what Richard's saying. It's that, yeah, I mean, I have looked at play, you know, the, the value of places, the connections that people make with place. And I think that that's one of the most valuable connections that you can you can kind of try and create for people is that if people feel that connection to a specific space that they want to, say, repeatedly visit, go back, take care of it, take ownership of it, I think that's something that is, again, it's always in relationship with, again, whether this place is free to get into, we have to pay for it. But those connections and experiences that people have, they start to link them to their own um, kind of lives, their own experiences. And that, again, can be something that I think can really create that, that long term experience rather than just this very kind of instant, you know, couple of days, couple of weeks sort of thing that we've talked about. Brill, yeah, really good point. Um, right, well, we're coming into the last couple of minutes. So um, rather than kind of rush, I don't know if you want to just take a minute or so to to just kind of round up with any little afterthoughts, some ideas of, of how these two kind of worlds can tie together for the benefit of, well, the planet, really. What do you think? Uh, Tom, if I nominate you first. Oh, bother. I hope you go. I thought you were going to ask the other Sorry. two first. I'm going to think. <laughs> um, now, I, th I, I just think that... Uh, I'm going to kind of reflect on um, the, the kind of the previous question that was put out because it was this idea about, um, I suppose, the right kind of fan practices. So um, Rich talked a little bit about, you know, rather than consumerism actually going out and just kind of like enjoying a space, for example. Um, the question asked about like, well, what happens if more and more people get enthused about that and maybe they they kind of they, they drop litter and then they're perhaps not doing it the right way. I think this is a this is something that I think natural history as a kind of uh, a collective perhaps needs to think about 
how do we gatekeep practices or do we gatekeep practices? Because I think there are some uh, some fandoms where fans attempt to say, well, you're doing that fandom in the wrong way. You need to be practicing fandom like this. Whereas I think probably, I haven't really thought about it, but I think there's probably, uh, it's more objectively true when it comes to interacting with wildlife spaces, for example, um, that you shouldn't disturb these these animals. And I think um, perhaps more than perhaps more than any other fandom, I think there's a degree about ethics uh, and ethical consumption of that fandom that I think natural history needs to reconcile perhaps before they start implementing. Uh, some of these ideas about kind of encouraging people to come like so it, it it needs to be practiced in the best way at the same time you don't want to put people off from going so uh i think essentially it's a delicate balance uh in terms of how people practice that fandom that's a good message um right richard and rebecca you're gonna have to do it really fast <laughs> super summary richard do you want to go next um, yeah, I will, um, the, the closing point I will make is just um, if, if you are someone who works in, 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 well, presumably if you're watching this, you are in environmental comms in some capacity and you're interested in fan communities, embracing them, cultivating, I, I would say um, one thing to be aware of is that fan communities, like any other aspect of, of society, uh, include good people and bad people and they are rife with inequalities and hierarchies in the same way that the rest of society is and i think it's really important to be attuned to that and recognize that it's um people's capacity to engage with the environment while clearly the environment is free and, and like lucy lovely phrase before it doesn't cost anything to enjoy a tree right um but actually you know tom made a point before about how um he wasn't able to appreciate bees until he had his own garden with with bees in them right so, so i think there are sort of um issues of social class in here i think it's perhaps easier to be a friend to the environment in some ways um if you have money than if you don't or if you have been brought up in a in a middle class household um and i think just be attuned to those inequalities and try to look for the people who are being excluded or people who have barriers in their way to kind of getting involved and think about ways that you can get rid of those barriers yeah really important thank you Richard that's great and uh Rebecca okay I'm going to be I'm going to be very quick um what I would say is that if anybody who is here um does want to know any more about this reach out there are lots of people beyond just the three of us doing really really excellent work um around fandom um around found cultures um and people starting to look at um, kind of natural history in different ways and, and fan engagement with that. So I'm sure we would all be happy if anyone wants to follow up with any of us um, or to put you in, in touch with anybody else um, or any resources that you might um, you might want to use. So thank you. Brilliant. And yeah, I will round off by saying thank you so much, everybody, for coming along today. I think it's been really interesting stuff I've never really thought about before or connecting up. So some great ideas. Um, a big thank you to Rebecca and Richard and Tom, um, all from the Fan Studies Network for their time. And I hope you enjoy the rest of Communicate. So thanks, everyone. We'll speak to you soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.